Uh, I'd like to introduce you all to Trevor Neal. Uh, Trevor Neal's been in the markets for almost 40 years now, I believe. Uh, he he's, uh, specializes in technical analysis, um, and you're start going to get a bit of a de demonstration today on some of the strategies he used. He started off on the London uh, Commodities Exchange, I believe. Yes. Uh, has been the head of technical analysis at uh, Bloomberg, so he's got a wealth of information and, and, and expertise. Uh, so. Yeah, I'll pass you over to Trevor um, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I work in a sort of institutional environment. I work with big traders, bankers, oil companies, those sort of things. And one of the wonderful things about technical analysis is that uh, technical analysis is a very democratic thing. Um, actually, I can tell you, you're at no particular disadvantage to those people in those big dealing rooms there. You've got charting, they've, got, they've basically got very similar indicators as you. They haven't got other ones that you haven't got. Um, they've got uh, powerful, very expensive screens that have maybe uh, more data than, than you would really want. Um, and, uh, and, but, you, but their ability to analyze it is not greater than yours. You know, it's just uh, you can become a good technical analyst, just as good as those people. So because they're in big institutions and have big amounts of money, you can be as good as them at doing technical analysis. Now, for people, for you and for them in a, on a different scale, it's all a matter of choice. We're all, it's uh, what should I do? I've got many things I can do. I've got a limited amount of capital. They have limited amounts of capital too and, and mandates which only allow them to do certain things. But we've got a finite amount. But we've got lots of things that we can participate in and lots of opportunities and the, cho the difficulty is making the choice of what's the best thing to do. Now, what I want to show you today is, a, is, is, is to do with making a choice about choosing and analysing many things together and seeing them clearly together um, so that you can make a, a good choice about what is the best thing to do. So let me just expand on this a little bit. If I talk simply uh, at the beginning, you, you've got an amount of money and you've got, an op you've got the option of putting the money simply into the stock market or into bonds, okay? One of those two things. Um, the, you've got many different types of graphs which will help you do that, ranging from the very simple to very, very complicated graphs. But here's a graph. This is, a, this is an old graph. I've deliberately done that. Um, and this is, this is the S&P some time, time ago. So here's a normal, normal chart without any indicators or trend lines on it of the S&P. So I don't know at this time what you think of the S&P here, uh, but we're, what we're likely to do is do something like this, is to crowd it out with a lot of um, indicators. And you can, you can recognize we've got Bollinger Bands here, we've got the Parabolic, we've got the MACD, um, we've got uh, the uh, stochastic and we've got the RSI on this. And this would, might be a typical trader's uh, chart, which is fine for analyzing this security. But it doesn't tell you whether this is a good thing to do compared to something else. And that becomes very complicated when you're trying to look across many different opportunities and choices. So let's look at this one here. Uh, what do you think? Um, anybody want to tell me what they think? this chart pattern is here. I'm sure there are people here. Man at the back putting up his hand and he's going to say... Uh, and no, it's... Uh, no, it's not. I, actually, it's the S&P. The label's on the top. <laughs> but what I meant was... What, 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 it's a reverse head and shoulders. So it's a, it's a head and shoulders. So here we've got a, a shoulder, head, and a, a right shoulder and the neckline drawn in here. So this is, for a chartist, perhaps a bullish-looking chart and an opportunity beginning, starting to begin to move. So we might say, um, I think there's opportunity in the S&P at this time. So don't forget, I've got a choice of the S&P or I've got a choice of bonds. And this is a, a bond ETF uh, here. Now, let's have a look at this chart. And um, here we've got an uptrend line. We've got this uh, triangle uh, line there. We've got a resistance level. It's challenging that resistance level here. Do you think this is a, is a more bullish or bearish sort of chart? Bullish chart. Would you say it's more bullish than the S&P? Which would you say is more bullish? The S&P. Um, now, that's a, that's a sort of difficult question to sort of answer. It, um, I've just got a choice of two things, and I can only put money in one or the other. 
theoretically. So which am I going to place my money in? That's a simple uh, choice that I've got to make. So, um, so the problem with a simple graph that, like the one we've just seen there is that um, uh, they only answer the question, um, should I invest in it and where should I invest in it? It, um, it? it really doesn't have any context whether this is good compared to something else. It's only a, a measurement of itself. Now, there is a way of looking at multiple things together in one chart and compare them like with like with each other. Now, this is a popular technique used in the institutional market. I'm going to show you something here that, that you can have access to, even though you haven't got a Bloomberg or a Reuters icon or one of these professional platforms. They license this, and it's popular amongst the professional fund managers and professional traders. And I'm going to show it to you and explain it to you now, but you can, you can see it. Uh, you don't have to have a Bloomberg or a Reuters uh, to see it. So. When we talk about this is better than that, we mean in a relative strength basis. This is better relative to the other thing. Relative is something divided by something. This is better than that, and it's outperforming the other thing. So relative strength is actually everything. Which is better is a relative strength question. This is better than that. So that's a relative question. So here we've got, and this is, would be a normal way of doing this, here we've got the S&P chart, that one with the reverse head and shoulders there. And then we've got the S&P um, divided by the treasury bonds. So now this is the relative performance of the two. And you could see that at this period here, um, that equities um, was uh, coming down in a downtrend in, in relative performance, but now it started to turn up. So you could say as a chartist, actually the, the previous condition where there was underperformance in the, in the equity market is actually changing and equity market is about to start to be the better investment. And so with my limited capital of cho um, that I've got and that choice that I've got between those two things, equities and bonds, equities should be the thing that I should be in and it wasn't the thing I shouldn't, should have been in up until now. Now, that's a very simple uh, question, but of course, it's not like that at all, as this gentleman realized. <laughs> it's, uh, it's much more complicated than that. So we could have bonds, and then there are all sorts of different nationalities of bonds. Which ones of those is better? Is Japan better than, is uh, Asia better than America? Equities, too. We've got many equity markets. So the whole tree of complexity um, is, is spreading out enormously. Now, if, um, these are here are the sectors of the S&P. And um, if you wanted to find out which is, the, which is the best sector in the S&P, this is actually an extremely complicated thing to do in terms of the, no, the, the number of choices that you've got. So if you want to compare, there are 10, there are actually now 11, but there are 10 on here, and 10 is an easy number to divide by and multiply by, so for, forgive me if I stick with 10 for a bit. <laughs> uh, but there are now 11, there's just been a new one added. Um, and, um, and here we've got uh, a series, if we wanted to look at everyone versus everyone, that's 10 things, how many charts do you think we would have to look at to compare everyone with everyone? Not quite. Uh, 100, but th then, you'd, then you'd be comparing the same with the same the other way around, so it's less than 100. Okay, I'll go through it with you. Okay, so let's do it here now. So here we don't want to compare um, the XLK with the XLK, so we can take all those ones out, the likes with likes, so we'll take all those ones out. Also, something compared to something, A compared to B is the same as B compared to A uh, as well, and so we can take half of them out because uh, uh, as well. So this leaves us with the following. The, with the 10 GICS level 1 sectors of the S&P, um, there would be 10 times 10, um, 100, minus 10, divided by, uh, would leave us with 90, divided by 2, and so that's 45 charts. So 10 sectors to actually compare every opportunity versus every opportunity requires you to look at 45 charts. That's a lot of charts, isn't it? 
If you were to go down to the industry level of, of uh, the S&P, there are 24 industry sectors, and 24 by 24 is 576, minus 24, leaving 552, divided by 2, so you're not comparing self with self, but that's 276 charts you'd have to look at. And all you're looking at is 24 industry sectors. Now, what do you think <laughs> the S&P 500 <laughs> is going to be? It's a very big number there. So it's virtually impossible for a human being to really do quite a modest task, which is to make a choice about things, because it's too many things to look at to make that choice. And even if you were trying to do it, you know, if you were sc scrolling through your charts and you were going through just 45 of them, you might say, well, that looks better, but I can't remember what that one was at uh, back there. So it's going to be very, very difficult indeed. So I want to present to you a solution uh, to this problem. So now there are 11, so I'll, I'll correct it now. So 11 times 11 is 121 minus 11 is 110 divided by 2. So it's actually even worse, it's 55 charts. So this is um, the uh, S&P materials sector here as a chart. And then this is the S&P materials sector uh, divided by the S&P itself. And so this is the outperformance or underperformance of the S&P. And, and you can see that at this stage here, as this fell down, relative to all the other parts of the sector, it, um, it underperformed very sharply, and then it's turned now upwards, crossing, that's a moving average, of course, uh, on it and crossing the moving average. So we can see the change in the relative performance uh, of it very clearly on that graph, but you'd have to be using that 270 uh, times. But the problem is, is the following. When you're trying to compare each of those to each other, is how do you compare them? Um, we've got a, um, a value here. Now, don't forget this is a ratio that we're looking at now, something divided by something. And this one, which looks pretty good, is at 0.182. Now, if we look at this next one here, which is healthcare divided by the uh, S&P, and, and this one here, when you look at this graph, I think you'd agree, does not look good at all. It's below its moving average, but it's at 0.32. It's a, a higher reading, but it's not, it's not as good. So the reading itself is not the measure you can use as to what is the best of, of these large number of graphs that you've been looking at. Uh, I can now introduce my colleague here, the JDK, Julius de Campanar, who's my uh, colleague in Relative Rotation Graphs uh, BV, uh, research, RRG Research BV, and um, we together um, are, uh, are involved in this business. He's the clever one. He invented it. Um, I just uh, do research and uh, work with people. So he's the clever one. There he is there. So the JDK is J Julius de Campanar. Um, now, this is, he has developed, or we've developed, a, a way of normalizing the ratios which allow us to compare like with like. So those numbers can be compared uh, to each other. And also bring another dimension to it, something that we technical analysts um, have all, uh, understand about price action. So the individual RS lines, they give a pretty good clue to the individual comparison um, versus the benchmark. So they answer the question whether it's good or bad, but they don't answer how the question how good they are compared to the other opportunities uh, that we've got. Or can you say best or worst either from that information that we've got? The raw relative strength values, what we were just seeing, seeing there, um, are like apples and oranges and really can't be compared to each other. So we've got a lot of charts that we've plowed through and it's now um, impossible to uh, compare them to each other. They have to be normalized and so that you can. And this is uh, ha um, the values now that we have, uh, by applying some mathematics to these values, we've created the JDK-RS ratio. So we've changed the ratios in that they are now normalized and you can compare each to each. And you say this is better than that. Now, if you look at um, the, uh, the sectors here, we, you've got the strongest one in this, uh, this time at the top, the weakest one at the bottom. What people want to do, of course, is to be involved in the things which are in the top part there, maybe the top quarter, the top quarter, that's where their holdings might be. Um, and they definitely don't want to be in the bottom part there. Uh, and fund managers will do the same. 
But the problem is, really, if you have your holdings in the top part there, you're missing a trick, really, because you're buying the things which have already arrived. The real money is to be made uh, buying the things w as they come up the list. In fact, uh, low in the list, coming up, and perhaps even accelerating up the list. But that's not something that you can see here. It's just a list, a column here. So we need more information, and, and so we need this extra dimension of, of time in it too. So the high values are good, the low values are bad, but how does this look over time? Is, the sort of is, is important. So here we've got um, uh, two lines here, and uh, I'll introduce the second line in a moment, but the first line is the RS ratio of the security. Here, here's 100 here, and, and we, we here is the uh, healthcare sector, and then here is its uh, uh, relative performance compared to the um, the S&P itself, and we can see um, where it's headed and where it's standing right now. But what it's still the high and the low readings in it here that we've got here. Um, the number is a number that you actually meet twice, once on the way down and potentially on on the way up, and that has a very different implication. On the, in relative terms, weak and getting weaker is very diff different from it's been weak and now it's getting stronger. And so these points here are potentially m are much more interesting points. Now, don't forget, we are talking all the time on a relative basis there. So we need to know the direction as well as the actual value, which that column in your Excel sheet only gave you the value itself. So we need to know the movement in the column itself. Um, so the other line is the rate of change of the relative ratio. Now, many of you in the room, I think, are technical analysts here. This is a momentum measurement. What do we know about momentum in relation to the price? Momentum precedes price. We slow up before we change direction. That's an invariable, really. So it's like if you throw a tennis ball into the air, if you had a high-speed camera and observed it as it approached the top, it would be slowing up and you'd be ever more ac able to accurately predict where the top is going to be by observing the slowing up. We slow up into the turning point and then we speed up out of the turning point. Slow up before we've reached the top. Slowing up, losing momentum, lo losing rate of change. Oscillators, you know, recognize this. And for example, you, you might be going up 10, up 10, up 10, up 6, up 4, up 2. We're still going up, but the RSI is going down because we're losing momentum. Momentum precedes price. We slow up into the top and then we speed up out of the other end. We slow up into lows and then we speed up out of, out of lows as it becomes clearer that the low's in place. So we've got a way of having a leading indicator of the changes in the ratio itself. So I've marked up on here um, this, this turning up, um, and then this turning down, this turning down, and this turning up, whereas the ratio is, uh, the momentum, sorry, is giving the same messages earlier. So we, will want, we want to capitalize on this phenomena, but in a way that's clearer and that we can put the all many, many things together in one picture. So we've got a lot of information now, comparable across the, a whole universe. The RS approach in general adds value to investment. I can talk to you a lot about this, but uh, um, there's a lot of academic work that um, uh, says, I suppose, the bleeding obvious, which is that if you're, not, if you're in the good things, you'll do better than the average. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, you know, a lot of academics uh, spend a lot of time explaining that to us. Um, but we don't want to have to flip through many, many charts, and wouldn't it be nice if we could put all this into one picture, have lots and lots of things all in one picture? So what, um, what we've done is we've made this scattergram. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamic scattergram of this information. On the x-axis here, we've got the ratio. So anything on that's on the right here of, of 100 is outperforming the benchmark in the middle. So let's say it was the S&P. It could be the dollar. 
It could be the technology index, and these could be the shares in the technology index. So any s benchmark, anything that is what you're trying to out do better than. Um, as I say, it could be a current. It could be currencies as well. It could be the dollar, and we look at how the other currencies are relating to that. Um, anything to the right, further to the right, means more outperformance on a relative basis, and then to the left is underperformance. Then you see we've got 100 across the screen here too, and, thi and this is the positive momentum of the relative performance. Okay, So the higher it is, the more positive momentum of relative performance. So think of the list there, that list being dynamic, and things might be coming up, the, the list from low readings up towards the top, and speeding up as they go up, so having increasing their momentum in relative strength. So this quadrant here, we call the leading quad quadrant. Anything that's in that quadrant is not only um, outperforming on a relative basis, but also has positive momentum. So these are good things here. Here are things that are weakening. They have got outperformance, but they're now losing that power. And then maybe at certain stages, candidates to get out of before they actually underperform when they cross that 100 line there. This is the horrible place that you don't want to be. This is, where, this is things which are un underperforming on a relative basis and also got no upside momentum in them at all. And then here is maybe the interesting and the aggressive, more aggressive and more exciting uh, place to be. These are things which are underperforming but are coming up the list with positive momentum. So these are the opportunities, if you like, to get in before other people have uh, noticed them. Now, we talk about in markets about rotation and uh, markets uh, rotating and sector rotation and things, and, and things do rotate. And you'll see in a moment they, they rotate in real life clockwise. That is the nature of the behavior of these things. So here we've got a, a chart which is the US sector ETFs there. And he, he, at this time, and we've got a scattergram of it. And this one here is the furthest to the right, and therefore is on a relative basis is the strongest one. It's also the highest one, so it's got the most positive momentum as well. Um, and then we've got things over to the left hand side, so we've got all these, it's, we've got a scattergram of these in different quadrants. Now that is quite interesting, but we're missing the thing, is which is the is how are they moving? Don't forget we saw that the getting to these levels, we get to them twice. Depends which way they're going through those high readings. Are they are they increasing or are they decreasing? So the way what we've done is we've taken, uh, we'll say what we'll do is we will sample a period earlier, and in this case it's going to be weekly, so we'll say last week. So what, what, where were they last week? So that way I get a, a pointer of how, how they're headed. So by adding one sample here, I can see this one is going in this direction, heading northeast, this one too. Um, and this one is moving a little bit in this direction. This is also moving a little bit in that direction. But that doesn't, that's not a lot of information and um, it's not really very help, not helpful enough. Now I've added um, uh, more points on it. Um, uh, and uh, so now we've got three data points on it and we've got a bit more of a story of where these things are headed. This, the XLV here, is heading eastwards on it. North Northeast would be best because northeast would mean it's increasing in both relative performance and positive momentum. E XLV is ha heading is in the wrong place. It's in the, it's in the uh, lagging segment, and it's also heading southwest. So its its direction is losing uh, relative performance and without positive momentum. So now I've made it uh, five weeks along, and I think we've got a, a clearer picture here. So how long should it be? How much information do you need? Um, well, you can put a lot in if you want, but I can tell you that it really you are most interested in what's happening recently as to what happened six months or a year ago. And so this is uh, now, this one has got 30 weeks of information. Now what we've managed to do is make what was a beautiful picture <laughs> into a very cluttered and unreadable picture. And actually, who cares where it was? 30 weeks ago, that doesn't really matter at all. We just want to know where it is now and where it's headed uh, now. But what it does show is this rotation 
this clockwise motion of through the sectors. You know, things come in and out of fashion, and um, the the theme is something or other, and then that wanes, and it uh, it and it's uh, it moves around there. Time, you know, it's all cyclical. This what's in fashion. Um, so. Uh, I think, well, that's, the, that's it, moving in a circle. So I would say, personally, um, I would say four or five is enough information. I just want the pointer of, of where it's headed. But what you have got in this is a lot of persistency in this, in the sense that the direction tends to persist in this sort of time frame here. Um, now, here... I've got it moving dynamically. You see here on the, the chart on the uh, top right here is the graph um, of the S&P itself. And this is the window that you're looking at, the five samples, that, the vertical lines there. And then here it is going through time. So this is the story of that coming up to today. And you can see how things have moved in and out of fashion and rotated around. Um, and this is the current, at the time, uh, value of them. So that's what we're trying to capitalize on, is this information of the relative performance. The good thing is now we can put all these things together with each other. We could, we could have more things in here and if we wanted to, and, and, and we can look at different things. So how do you interpret all this information here? The first thing is that, um, so this is, um, this is the Dow, um, uh, or the US 30, I think I have to call it, <laughs> the US 30, the 30 stocks of the Dow, um, in the scattergram here with no tail on it. So we'll add anything that's in this top right-hand corner, which we call the uh, leading quadrant, you might basically say are good holding things. They're, they've got outperformance and they've got good momentum as well. Here, the weakening quadrant are things that you potentially want to be getting out of and getting out of your portfolio, moving away uh, from. Here is the lagging quadrant. This is things to avoid. Um, and then here is these are the look for the uh, a look for buys or resells in these in that sector there. And these are, if you are a more aggressive trader, this is the area you'll be looking at for. You'll be looking for things in here that are close enough to the hundred and also heading in the northeast direction, and ideally also with the sample lengths expanding. That means they're going up faster. You know, this week to last week and the week before, that is an expanding pattern. That means it's going faster. They're going further each week. So we now got a picture of that. So that's the basic uh, message of those four quadrants and your opportunities or indeed your portfolio. So we can also uh, look at it in another way, uh, that um, anything that's moving this way and is, is um, I heading this way, you could say, is a, is a, or anything in that sector is a conservative buy. This is a conservative sell. Incidentally, if you were a pairs trader, if you were looking to buy something versus something, then anything in the top right here, you match off with something looking southwest in the bottom left of it. That's a nice way to, to pair off uh, some things. Um, the aggressive buys in this sector here and aggressive sells in this weakening sector here. So those are the basic messages. A Couple of extra things is, Things say up at the top there is a long way from the middle. Uh, the middle but is the is the Dow itself. Is Goldman Sachs uh, in this at this time here? Now it's a long way from the benchmark, and so for to get our performance to generate true alpha, you have to get outperform the benchmark itself. So the best opportunities are away from the middle. Anything that's in the near the middle is doing what the index is doing, and so you're not going to get outperformance from that. Um, so here now, this is the 30th of August, but I'm going to show you in a second um, the current uh, values for it. But um, uh, here's how we were looking. Uh, this is uh, weekly samples in it, and um, you could see, and that's versus the S&P, yes. So I'll, I'll actually go to the, the real live uh, version now, and, and we can look at it right up to date. So this is, um, this is the stocks 50 the actual 50 stocks of the, the stocks 50. And as you can see, there's Bayer up at the top there, s screaming around there, uh, there. And, um, you know, I'd be worried about anything that I saw coming down in here if I had it in my portfolio. 
Here's uh, currencies versus the dollar. So this is a, uh, in the middle, we've got the US dollar and we've got the, um, uh, the yen here. Um, and then over there, we've got <laughs> GBP. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we, let's say a very good trade here, I think would be um, pairing off. I think you can work out for yourself <laughs> what might be the best thing to do rather than be long of the, the yen or something like that. There's a better trade to be had, which is very clear on here. Um, so wrapping up. Visualize the rel relative trends and the positions of the elements in a universe in this unique way. Now, this has been available um, for more than 10 years on Bloomberg, but you have to pay more than $2,000 a month uh, to get a, a Bloomberg terminal. And also on the ICON is the, is the Refinitiv, the Reuters uh, terminal. But it is now available also on a, on a retail platform, and it's free, and also Judith's research is available, and he writes analysis of uh, the messages of RRG, which you can see for free as well. So it's not a trading system per se. If, as you can see there, it's quite subjective, like a chart. It is subjective. Um, it, uh, uh, so it's not, a, it's not an algo at, at all, it's, um, but it is a way of uh, visualizing complicated lot of data in a clear, uh, uh, a clear way. And that's uh, the challenge of today. Um, it shows that markets do really rotate. This is a picture of it doing that thing that we talk about. Markets did this 100 years ago. Um, they did it 50 years ago. They'll continue to do it. There's nothing changing about that. The fact that it's been discovered doesn't mean it won't work. Um, history repeats itself, and it does it in circles. <laughs> um, the RRG charts help you visualize the rotational behavior and make better informed choices. So. Um, here's my contact details, here's uh, the website. I urge you to go and have a look at the relative rotation graphs.com. There's a lot of free uh, stuff on there and, and articles and things like that that uh, we've written about, uh, about using this in practice. Um, but I would draw your attention to uh, stockcharts.com slash articles slash RRG because that's the interpretation written by Julius and he writes um, a lot of great stuff on the markets and what the messages are um, about the markets and um, uh, you know the sectors yes but also the individual uh, securities as well so within the industry groups and in within the, s the sectors and even asset classes as well. Mm -hmm.